Maria Eduarda Silva for the invitation to talk. Uh, in general, I've tried to uh, keep the presentation uh, you know, uh, intuitive, but also to resonate with the wide uh, audience uh, in, in management studies. So beyond finance and beyond banking, as you will see. Um, I've also tried to provide some, uh, some R codes, R coding, uh, to, to better you know, uh, support those that want to or wish to implement uh, the method. And uh, in the end, obviously, there will be time for Q&A. So the agenda uh, will be, uh, we'll, we'll start with the general conditions for the application of the method. Uh, then I'll speak briefly about the specific context of banking that led to the need to develop this new method, followed by a step-by-step, -step, uh, sorry, uh, before that, uh, an overview of the clustering methods and valuation criteria used. Then a step-by-step -step overview of the method uh, and the choices made. I think this is an interesting uh, point to, to you know, pay special attention because I'll try to explore the, the exact options that were made at each step, also enabling you know, any other uh, uh, researcher to, to explore other options. Uh, I'll try to do this the best I can and then present some results and key takeaways. Okay, so this method that I'll present uh, will be particularly useful uh, if a researcher follows or, or has the, the, the following preconditions. First, he, uh, he suspects that groups exist in data based either on literature or on the observation of the real world. Uh, there must be some kind of driver that leads us to, to suspect that groups exist. This will be particularly relevant in the case of, of this method because um, we will apply fuzzy uh, clustering, as I'll uh, see, I'll show uh, in a minute. And under these methods, the fuzzy cl clustering, you can find groups uh, basically anywhere, uh, but the meaning of those groups has to be uh, a precondition, obviously. The second point is that uh, the researcher suspects that data points may have affinity with more than one group, which goes beyond, let's say, the hard clustering approach. Uh, the third point is that uh, he suspects that uh, uh, the allocation or the assignment to, of the data points to groups may suffer change over time. And finally, he has no access to true assignments of each data point. This will be important uh, in the training process or the tr training stage of the, of the algorithm. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that we will perform so-called unsupervising uh, unsupervised clustering. To go a step further, uh, when reflecting about uh, other applications in man management studies, uh, identified the following case. So a researcher has a, a data set with firms, very heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous firms in the sample. And he suspects that the baseline results may change depending on uh, the firm's business orientation with respect to you know, a number of possible drivers such as activities, funding, uh, products or geographies. And uh, as you can see, I've deep dived a little bit more. Uh, we can see that the four topics or the four preconditions I just mentioned um, in, in respect to the activities uh, might go something like this. So uh, you can have a firm uh, with respect to the first point where uh, that firm has some activity in more than one uh, sector of activity or NASA code. Uh, the researcher suspects that there might be a grouping 
uh, beyond that, that sector of activity, for instance, coupling real estate with construction and transportation, because he believes there may be synergies in those activities, for instance. Then the second condition is met because firms may in fact operate in more than one activity, especially if we talk about holding companies, for instance. Uh, and if a merger happens, uh, he uh, the firm may, may have a mixed grouping. Uh, so so uh, let's say condition three also is met if, uh, if we believe that mergers may happen uh, and no true grouping exists. So this is just an example to speak to a wider uh, audience uh, as why this method may be relevant for more than just identifying banking business models. But because I've spent so much time looking at uh, exactly this context, let me uh, talk about what, uh, what led us to, to apply the method to, to banking. So let's take um, a very simple uh, prototypical uh, definition of bank as an institution that captures funds, namely deposits, but not only. Uh, the, the bank captures uh, his res its resources and invests in financial assets issued by borrowers. This can be loans, but also uh, debt securities and, and other, uh, other financial assets. Um, also providing in the meanwhile, financial services such as payment services and others to different types of activity, uh, customers, sorry. So if we take this definition, uh, what literature has looked to do is to move beyond, uh, let's say, looking at each of the strategic choices that a manager may, may make, a bank man manager may, may perform or, or, or follow, such as the type of activities, funding sources, the size, and so forth, and to, let's say, uh, reduce that dimensionality to speak in data analysis uh, terms, into a single proxy, discrete or continuous, which uh, may reflect uh, in, in a summary, in a nutshell, how the bank operates its business. So this is what literature has, uh, has labeled as business model. Uh, to give you two examples, uh, on one extreme, you have retail banking, where uh, the bank is mainly focused on uh, capturing uh, deposits and lending to customers, SME uh, mainly, but not only obviously, uh, and providing standard services. Important aspect of this is that a retail bank is mainly uh, exposed to credit risk. Uh, I don't want to go too much into uh, to the, this part, but this is an important aspect because the business model will allow us to identify these risk, risk exposures uh, in a brief manner. And on the other extreme, you will have the diversified banking, where you know, if you look at the brief terms, the balance sheet of a bank, essentially we're saying that the bank has a diverse uh, funding uh, structure as well as a diverse asset structure uh, where it applies uh, its, uh, its resources. An uh, important aspect is that this exposes the bank to more risks than just credit risk uh, and different types of risk and uh, has been documented that it also you know, yields systemic risk for, for the entire uh, system as a whole. Um, just one more motivation before we, we talk about uh, the method, which is the, the main source or main focus of the, of the talk. <clears throat> so for academia, um, this, this notion of business model uh, is interesting, and this might even speak to, a, to, to other fields as well, because what we do is we essentially test conventional or standard or uh, hypothesis in, uh, in literature uh, by using 
uh, the business model as, for instance, the mediating factor. That is, uh, instead of only looking at the full sample of banks, we may check whether the results are sensitive to the specific type of banking uh, in question. And as I said, uh, this will also yield specific risks and vulnerabilities. In terms of regulation and supervision, uh, this is public knowledge, so uh, I'm not breaching any uh, any information. Uh, this is uh, the, the notion of business model is currently a centerpiece in uh, what is called the supervisory review and evaluation process performed by by European um, supervisors of banks, uh, and that has an implication in terms of uh, capital requirements. So it 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 has some implication in terms of uh, uh, shareholder, uh, let's say, pockets or money. So this is an important issue for, for, for stakeholders, let's say. But there are methods already in place. Uh, and so just let me briefly explain why the, the methods that, you, that are in place today were not sufficient to, to meet our needs. Um, one of the most interesting works uh, that is performed by, uh, by the European uh, Banking Authority staff, uh, Cernov and Urbano, they, they identify business models of banks uh, using qualitative information. The problem is that uh, from an academia point of view, it, those results are basically impo impossible to replicate because they use uh, non-public information. Um, also other works have used factor analysis and principal components, but you know, that falls short of uh, identifying uh, a clear business model, a discrete business model, which is uh, important to perform uh, benchmarking analysis. And if we use our clustering methods, uh, essentially the, the poor clusters uh, or poor quality of clusters yield some concerns about whether the, uh, let's say the business models identified are in fact uh, reasonable and, uh, and reliable, let's say. Okay, having performed this uh, brief context, now let me uh, turn to the, to the methods that are used. Okay, this will be uh, then, I think, understood better when we look at the step-by-step -step overview, but uh, let me spend some time here. I don't know how my time is, uh, um, but uh, I think uh, it makes some sense to, to discuss uh, what, what are the, the methods that are used, okay? so. The first method that, uh, that we use is, is based on fuzzy clustering. And the generic idea of fuzzy uh, clustering is that um, a data point uh, may have some level of affinity, if you will, or uh, resemblance to more than one cluster, okay? So instead of having a binary function of zero or one, belonging or not belonging to a cluster, uh, the fuzzy clustering allows us to have a continuous function uh, and the value will be called percentage of cluster membership. So if you sum all the percentage cluster me memberships of a given data point, it will sum up to one. Um, and let's say that the nearer the membership value is to one, the higher it is the similarity between the observation and, and the cluster. Um, we use fuzzy C-means, which is the, the most standard, let's say, uh, algorithm in this family of, of, of um, methods. And essentially uh, what this, this uh, method does is pretty much similar to, to a standard uh, clustering method, just to minimize the within group sum of squares. Um, but using what is called a weighting scheme, which is given by uh, mu here. Uh, and this 
weighting scheme allows us to have a continuous function uh, in the in the uh, in the percentage cluster uh, membership. Now the M that you see here is a very important uh, parameter, which is called the fuzzy fire. Uh, and if the fuzzy fire is zero, it actually means it's, it's an interesting uh, result that you are performing hard clustering. Okay, so the more you fuzzy file, let's say, the algorithm, uh, the more uh, the, the continuous function is, let's say, uh, uh, further away from uh, binary. The second method that we use is called self-organizing maps. Uh, it's uh, basically a form of artificial neural network that reduces dimensionality, also using uh, a weighting scheme, let's say, that is called in this case a codebook vector that projects the input layer that you see here on the right to a two-dimensional space or output layer uh, that you see uh, on the right side. Uh, how does it work in a nutshell? Essentially, we have to predetermine the number of neurons or uh, clusters. Let's say in our case, it was four or five or six, then we can you know, perform valuation criteria to check uh, which, which one performs best, uh, which number of clusters performs best. But uh, um, after predetermining the number of neurons, the algorithm will identify sequ sequentially for each data point which cluster or neuron is closest to, the, to a given point, the so-called winning neuron. Uh, and then uh, after doing that, uh, let's say, assignment of the, of the data point, it updates the codebook vector, not only of the neuron, but also of the neighbor neurons. That is, uh, let's say, a difference, important difference uh, regarding the other other methods, another difference that uh, that is interesting for our empirical setting is that it allows us to have a very effective visual visualization tool uh, because it essentially projects um, all our information into a two dimensional space, and you will see uh, in in uh, in a minute. Uh, how these maps uh, work and how how interesting they, they are. And finally, uh, the partitioning around methods is also used uh, where, you know, it's very briefly, the idea is uh, that uh, there is a predetermined number of clusters, uh, the uh, data set, or data, sorry, the data points are allocated to to, to each of the cluster based on uh, a function, a very uh, simple function of uh, a cost function, let's say. Uh, and then after ha having assigned uh, the data points, it, it then is um, um, rerun, let's say, the algorithm based on uh, the most representative uh, data point, that is the one that is has the, the, the lowest cost or the lowest uh, distance to, to other points in the same cluster. Uh, and by performing this, uh, the, the second step, uh, the, 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 the clusters are uh, updated as well. So an important aspect of this, uh, of this method is that because it uses uh, the methoid instead of uh, the means, it handles better uh, outliers. Okay, having said this, uh, what is the ensemble that is in the name of the paper and the method? Essentially, the ensemble is the combination of the information provided uh, by the partitions. So if we can uh, have an illustration of, of this, essentially, it's as if we are asking the, the three uh, clustering methods that I just referred for their diagnosis on what is the allocation 
of uh, the data set in terms of clusters, the best, let's say, the best uh, allocation possible. Uh, and then following a so-called consensus scheme, uh, we can then elect which is the best, uh, let's say, the, the final diagnosis, okay? Um, there are different consensus schemes. And uh, as, as mentioned by Kuncheva, uh, that accuracy is um, expected to increase with the diversity of, of methods. Okay. Finally, in terms of uh, uh, methodological explanations, I will very briefly mention uh, the three, uh, sorry, the four evaluation criteria that are used throughout the paper. Um, this is very standard in clustering uh, uh, literature, but uh, it may be interesting for PhD or, or master's students to, to have this information. So I've included uh, essentially to assess the quality of the clusters, we look at the silhouette width, which compares the average distance between observations uh, and the assigned cluster uh, versus um, the observations in the nearest cluster. So this gives us a measure of how uh, separated the, uh, the clusters are. This is an interesting feature of this criteria is that it gives us information at the uh, observation level and not at the cluster level or even at the, uh, let's say, the, the full sample level. The kalinsky hanabas essentially compares the between group to within group uh, um, sum of squares. This is the most traditional uh, measure. Uh, and then we have two additional Davis, Baldwin, and Dunn index, which in essence are very similar to the kalinsky harabas but uh, look at uh, different points, let's say, in the, uh, uh, in the clusters um, and not the, the full, the full uh, data set, the data points. I would say that that is the main difference. Um, okay, so just breathe a little bit. <laughs> it's a lot of information. I'm sure that I'm very late, uh, but uh, this is the most important uh, slide. Uh, and I would like to take a minute to, to, uh, to adequately address this, this slide. So how does the method actually work? First, we have to check obviously the conditions to use the method. This is the only step throughout the process where only the researcher can do. That's why it is painted in, um, in gray. Um, the next step is to select the input variables. Now, what we've done in our paper was to identify the, the input variables based on literature. We identified 10 different business model variables. There is an alternative and that's why it's blue and uh, <clears throat> gray, because you can, uh, let's say, rely on software to uh, identify the, the adequate input variables using feature selection. The next step is to use those input variables or to reduce the dimensionality using uh, some kind of uh, method. We use principal component analysis, but factor analysis would also be appropriate. This reduces the noise in the data and importantly, in our case, allows us to perform clustering in orthogonal space. We impose a limit, uh, we impose that we have to retain uh, components in order to at least have 80% of the total variation explained. Then we have to select the clustering methods. We've already uh, covered this extensively uh, before the three methods that I've explained. We identify these methods based on literature and also some experimentation, but there are also you know, ways of uh, selecting the method uh, automatically, let's say, based on software for method selection. Um, 
then what we do is we perform clustering, obviously using R. Uh, I will, I mean, in the end I can show the R code, but the presentation will be made available. So uh, uh, don't don't need to 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 spend time on this. Then we identify the optimal number of clusters. This is based on the internal valuation criteria that I've also mentioned, the four, the four uh, criteria. This step actually is important because of the harmonization of the clustering output. Because let's say we identify four uh, clustering partition as the optimal uh, solution. Then we have to make sure that cluster number one which for our case was uh, called retail focused business model is the same in uh, the three methods. You see, this has, can be done either via software or you know, just looking at the mean values in, in the Excel uh, sheet, right? So we have to make sure that uh, cluster number one is the same in all uh, methods. Then we join the clusters. In this case, we use a, a majority uh, voting rule. Uh, so just to make, uh, make it completely clear, there may be a case where a bank uh, in our empirical setting is allocated to the retail focused uh, model by two of the methods and another model uh, by another method, by the third method. method. Using a majority scheme, we allocate it to the retail focused model because it has the majority of votes. You see, uh, I think it's quite intuitive. Then we analyze obviously the clustering ensemble outputs using a variety of measures such as simple matching, Jacquard index, the adjusted uh, RAND index, uh, the uh, chi-square independence test. So a lot of analysis into how stable and, and how similar are the, the outputs. And then we do something a bit innovative, which is to identify the core banks in each um, uh, cluster by imposing that uh, core banks are those for which the voting is unanimous among the uh, methods and for which the silhouette width is above a certain uh, threshold. Then we perform, let's say, uh, the method for sub periods instead of the full period and check whether banks change uh, business model over time. Uh, if they don't, we, we label them as persistent. And finally, we, we perform a wide variety of uh, robustness checks. Uh, I mean, this, this was a, a critical point for the publication of the, the paper. We perform random sampling. We change the methods instead of the three that we've talked. Uh, we've included also hierarchical clustering, model-based clustering, and so forth. Uh, and this is also you know, part of the paper and you can, you can check. Okay, so quickly checking some of the results. So the first result is that we found four business models uh, for which uh, there is significant uh, difference in terms of the risk exposure. So this table shows um, the step related to the assessment of the quality of uh, the clusters. And you see here, there is some, um, some consensus among the silhouette width and the clustering, uh, sorry, the kalinsky harabas index regarding the four partition solution. Um, so that's why we, we, we use four business models. Here we see only parts of the, the self-organizing maps. And just to be, to be clear, because this can be confusing, uh, the first map you can see on the uh, top left um, map uh, is a, a legend, let's say, of uh, how, uh, of which neurons correspond 
to which uh, business models. Um, and so when we move to the uh, to the, these colored uh, the colored um, maps or uh, heat maps almost, we see that for instance for gross loans to customers, uh, the, the yellow neurons or clusters uh, represent high values of uh, gross loans to customers. So if we generically uh, associate uh, loans to customers to the, to the banking book and to credit risk, we can see that banks in these two uh, neurons are more exposed to credit risk. On the other hand, if you move to the other two maps, uh, below trading assets and total assets. We see that, for instance, on the top right neuron, uh, which is composed of 50 large diversified uh, banks, uh, the market risk is expected to be greater because the trading assets are, uh, are uh, or because these banks exhibit a high value of trading assets. Um, and then just to move to the, to the customer deposits, we can see that uh, all the neurons to the right of the map have less uh, reliance on customer deposits. If uh, we assume that in Europe, uh, the customer deposits are guaranteed by uh, deposit guarantee schemes, this means that on the right side you have uh, banks that are more reliant on debt issuance, uh, which are not guaranteed and hence have uh, more exposure to funding, to funding risk. Okay, so this uh, brief uh, overview of the self-organizing maps, I think, shows how um, interesting, I think, uh, these, these maps can be in, in different contexts. Then just to briefly note two other results. First, the result related to the, to the core banks and the level of affinity of banks with, uh, with, uh, with more than one business model. So we see that uh, just to, to, to be as brief as possible, we have two business models, which is the business model one and the business model four, which uh, for which the banks tend to uh, follow closely the pro prototypical configuration uh, because the number of core banks is relatively high uh, related to uh, or in comparison with the, with the total sample. Uh, whereas these two other business models we found were uh, more fuzzy, let's say. And so this may have some implication in terms of uh, how they, they must be supervised because they're uh, less clearly defined, I'd say. And finally, for, for our empirical setting, it would, was really interesting to note uh, the height, let's say, of mobility barriers across business models. Let's say this is related to um, which characteristics of uh, the business model uh, make banks less prone or less able to change uh, from one business model to the other. And, and that characteristic is different across business models. We see that for retail focused, it is the, their exposure to customer deposits for uh, wholesale funding, uh, so, sorry, for funding diversified, retail diversified funding, it is the size um for the uh, third business model it is the exposure to interbank lending and the large diversified model um, also related to to size so the mobility barriers uh were were something that we also uh, looked at so key takeaways from this presentation uh, the method has a variety of applications in management studies. We try to, to make that clear in the first slides. Um, the paper also defines the method in question step by step. I mean, the, if you take a look at the, the paper, 
uh, it is also almost like uh, a manual of procedures. Uh, it is uh, very detailed, but I think in a positive way uh, because it allows you to replicate the method if uh, you're interested. And when applying to, to the empirical setting of banks, we find for business models, uh, different levels of fuzziness and uh, different heights and types of, of mobility barriers. What's next? So first to implement this method, uh, we already are doing that in two additional papers from the thesis where we are looking at ways in which uh, the baseline results for a sample, in our case of banks, uh, changes depending on the business model. Uh, this is a key feature of, of the thesis to explore this heterogeneity. And a second driver or uh, issue is to improve the method. Obviously, we know that the method is not perfect, will uh, benefit immensely from, uh, for instance, incorporating the time dimension using time series clustering uh, and perhaps even using interval data instead of, of means, which is what uh, the method uses to, to identify uh, or to perform the the, uh, the principal component analysis. And this, this is my presentation. I'm, I thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to answer to any questions. Um, so please uh, fire. <laughs>